Yeah, yes, I do take things quite literally. Well, thank you, everybody. I know uh, we just all, or most people, probably had uh, Mexican tacos. So just for uh, housekeeping, women's rooms that way, men's rooms that way, uh, post your uh, taco truck, because we know how taco trucks can come back to haunt us in certain ways. But I digress. Again, thank you, everybody, coming. I'm Matt Rose. I'm the field CISO at Reversing Labs. And today's talk is entitled, as you can see behind me, the monsters in your software supply chain that AST scanning tools can't find. This is something I put together, and if anybody's seen me present before, this is uh, about 40 slides. We're going to try and ram into 20 minutes, uh, lots of bullets. Actually, it's the exact opposite. I like to kind of communicate things in a way with visuals, pop culture references, analogies. Um, it's kind of like the way my, my brain kind of works like Family Guy, so it's always referencing things. and. Uh, using strange analogies. So let's jump into it. I'll give you a little information on who I am exactly. So again, we're already starting with the, uh, the movie quotes and everything. Um, in a smaller audience, I usually query the audience, but I'm hoping at least 50% know this is airplane. But my background, uh, which was mentioned, I've been doing this 20 years. I was actually started in the AppSec space uh, in the middle 2000s. I was actually one of the first sales engineers for Fortify Software when they came out uh, and introduced one of the first uh, enterprise SaaS products or static application security testing. Um, it was an interesting time because I would go in to talk to people about scanning their code for vulnerabilities. And I, at that point, scanning your code was a weird concept. People would look at me kind of funny like a dog watching TV, cocking their head going, you want me to do what to my code? That sounds really perverse. You want to do that, that? You didn't even take it out to dinner first and you want to scan it? Uh, I have an IPS, I have an IDS, I, I have a firewall, everything's fine. Well, as we know, application security is now a foundational piece of any security program for DOD, civilian agencies, enterprise, financials, so on and so forth. Uh, had pretty much every uh, role uh, in application security from consultant to sales engineer to sales engineering director done a lot of things. I've been quoted in probably over 100 articles right now, and I do a video glassboard series uh, called Reversing Glass. A lot of people know me for my glassboard series. It kind of came to fruition with the pandemic where I couldn't be in front of people anymore, so I bought a tool that was designed for teachers, and the rest is history. But the big thing, just to set the level uh, in this movie, is Airplane, and what's the famous line from Airplane? Don't call me Shirley. Well, don't call me Matthew. So everyone calls me Matthew. Is it Matt or Matthew? Matthew is what my mother called me when I was in trouble, and I heard it a lot because I was a little bit uh, uh, troublesome as a child. So if I hear Matthew, I kind of think my mom's coming after me. So please, let's just call me Matt. But let's jump into it because this is a shorter presentation. I usually do this for about an hour with a lot of audience participation. Um, definitely going to be around for questions afterwards. Come by. I'm outside with Reversing Glass with my other friend, Matt. And his name is Matt Reynolds, and I'm Matt Rose, so just ask for Matt R, and you'll find us. Uh, so with that, we'll jump in. What is changing in software? It's not a presentation at B-Sides or any conference without some metrics. Uh, I'm not going to read the metrics to you, but you know, if you don't put metrics or, or statistics in your slides, you're, you're deemed uh, insufficient. You need to back your, your statements up. But basically what this is saying is software supply chain security risks are on the rise. The reason being is the nefarious dudes, as I like to call them, have figured out that they could try and hack everyone in this room individually through social media or through reverse engineering or doing all these type of things. But they found out it's much easier to take the longer con, hack the software, the application itself, and then let normal distribution processes go out. Prime example is SolarWinds. They hacked SolarWinds. It was a hack of the MS build environment. I'll go into this in a little bit. But that was distributed through a normal product update to 18,000 individuals. Yes, it was a little longer con, but the benefit was so much more. But what, we, what really has promoted software supply chain security? Well, it's the way software is being developed. And again, I'm about visuals and references, so think about software development five, 10 years ago, plotting. Waterfall development, you released every three months. It was like the Flintstones. I mean, it was the... If we look back, the Stone Age way to do something, and Fred and Wilma and Barney and the rest of the family, the biggest change I see here is that the dog or the pet is Dino the dinosaur, and now we've moved into modern CI, CD development, uh, microservices architecture, cloud-native development, 
and we've moved to the Jetsons. This is the same entity, the same kind of footprint, but much more modernized. I'm still really disappointed that the flying cars haven't come to fruition, but the flying DevOps pipelines releasing sometimes a thousand times a day is real. And I think that really ties directly into the Jetsons as an analogy. And again, for analogies, let's jump into top. I always like to kind of paint the picture. And if anybody yells out, anybody know what this movie is? Anyone? You, you got it. The name of the movie is Gung Ho. And I think it's applicable to software supply chain security. When you hear supply chain, your mind a lot of times go to like supply chain in terms of a physical assembly line. And that goes to cars. And hey, there's processes changing. Well, Gung Ho, it's a great cult movie. It's a little bit obscure. But that's exactly what happened. They were building cars the American way. It wasn't going well. They got bought by a Japanese uh, company. And all of a sudden, all these new methodologies and processes were introduced. So to kind of bridge the gap from an assembly line to modern software development and software supply chains, I thought this was a great example. An obscure example, but I think it fits pretty well. And by the way, it took me a long time to come up with this one. I tried so many different analogies. So hopefully, uh, if you have uh, a free moment, check out Gung Ho. It's probably uh, buried in your Netflix somewhere as a ancient classic at this point. So as we move forward, whoops, I went too fast there. Another analogy, and this is where I get into it. How many people, when they were sick as a kid, and I'm, I know there's probably some younger people in there, there were two things you watched when you were sick as a kid. There was The Price is Right with Bob Barker, rest in peace, and then Days of Our Lives. Like sands through the hourglass, these are the days of our lives. But the hourglass is a great representation of software development. And, and you're probably saying, what the heck are you talking about? Well, if you take this hourglass, again, I think it's the most famous hourglass out there. There's many different movies you could use, but again, I wanted to be obscure and unique. We take this on the, put it on its side, and you think of everything left of the middle of the hourglass is pre-compilation and deployment activities. Everything to the right is deployment, post-compilation. So as you're on your left, you have your IDE environments. You have your code repos, Git in this example. You have your binary repositories. And I got off the thing. You have your, your tooling, your CI orchestration, you know, Circle CI or Jenkins or whatever running your CI orchestration. You have your build environment. This is a representation of MS build. And then lastly, you have your open source repositories, NPM, PyPy, whatever it is. Guess what? That's a lot of crap right there. That's a lot of things that has to work perfectly every time to ensure that your software supply chain is working correctly. So you can use the best tooling out there, and I'll get into this in a second. It's a question of to errors human. There's so many things happening in modern software development processes in a DevOps ecosystem. I challenge you to find one person that knows everything. It's, it's a house of cards, and that's why software supply chain security is becoming more and more important, because the, the nefarious dudes are banking on just speed, scale, and confusion. And then what do you do with this? After you had to hit that inflection point, that that uh, uh, golden disk, if you will, in the middle, then it's deployed to a cloud environment. You go into a container, you go into a data center. Again, all these type of tooling, cloud, uh, you know, this term posture is floating around the industry, cloud security posture management, application security posture management, the posture, the posture, the posture, how good is it, how bad is it? Again, we got more things we gotta do. But when you're talking about supply chain security or software supply chain security, there's this inflection point, this, this significant and very, very small moment in time. Post-compilation, pre-deployment, you're creating a package, you're creating an artifact, a DLL, a WAR file, an ISO, whatever that is, that is the thing that people, you're, you're trying to create and deploy. That's where you test, and I feel is the best way to test for potential risks in your supply chain. Think of it as the final exam. The sand goes through the hourglass, that's the final exam. It's easier to look at the grain of sand as it's going through that inflection point than it is when it's actually deployed out to the world for everybody to use or everybody working on it in terms of the source code, first party code, third party code, COTS, so on and so forth. So AST looks at our application security testing technologies. I like to use the acronym STAR AST because we have SAS, DAST, IAST, and then my favorite one today is YAST, yet another security tool. So we're in a stage where we're looking at the components 
not the entire entity. And you know what? All these tools are fantastic. Uh, I've been in this space a long time. They all look for a lens of risk that's important, but they don't look for a comprehensive list. So we're going to use another one of my, my crazy analogies. We have APIs. And that the identified risks, and with time, I'm not going to be able to go through them. But these are the things that API scanning solutions. This is a newer technology in the AST. Because guess what? Applications are not unto themselves. They're not an island. They're an interconnected network through APIs everywhere. So that is a lens of risk. It's very important. The second one was the source code itself. This is where my uh, career has really taken me, is around SAST and static application security testing, scanning the uncompiled source code for vulnerabilities that kind of line up with the OWASP top 10, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, so on and so forth. Again, important. Then you have open source. SCA has become a, a, a big uh, solution and very important where you're talking about the open source packages. And the thing that I find interesting is you read the industry analysts, they say 40 to 80% of all modern software and applications is open source. I agree with that, but that, that is a huge margin of error. And even if you're at 80%, you're still missing 20% of the first party code in the other pieces. So just thinking that your software supply chain security program can exist just with SCA, it's important to identify risks and upgrade and uh, licensing issues within uh, your open source packages, but it is not a comprehensive, complete solution. We have the running applications when you're testing again for the same type of OWASP top 10, top 10 issues but in a running application compared to static code. And that's DAS, dynamic application security testing, or the manual pen testers that are trying to use their tricks and their, their tools in their toolbox to kind of break the application and find vulnerabilities. You have the QA environment. Again, there's a lot of things happening here. QA is leveraging IAST in the functional test to point out a new lens of risk in a running application from the inside out. And then if you move into the production environment, there's always runtime application self-protection. That's a mouthful but basically taking that firewall aspect and putting it in the application or the app server itself. But you take all the robots, anybody know who the robots are? Nobody? Nobody's a Transformers fan? Transformers, but okay, that's, there's, there's a lot of Transformers. We gotta be more specific. How many people have been, anybody been to Universal in uh, Florida? The Transformers ride? Well, they've really upped their game in terms of representing this, these are the Constructicons, and the Constructicons are, you know, it was kind of like uh, Deadpool where it's like five, baby, five lions become one super lion, while five robots become one giant robot. And this is Devastator. Devastator is your compiled package. And if you look at this, all of these things that you're looking for, when you look at the complete package, the first party code, the third party card, the open source code, uh, the, the uh, COT space uh, components in your application, this is where malware, behaviors, tampering, all things that are unique to software supply chain security come into play. And if you look at each of the little robots, you're never going to find these things because you're only looking at a piece of the puzzle. It's only going to provide risk or a lens of risk. We have some stickers over there. A couple of people asked me what they meant. And it says vulnerabilities are overrated. Vulnerabilities are important. But if you're looking at software supply chain risk, it's malware. And the difference between vulnerabilities and malware, vulnerabilities is something was written to do something, but it does some bad things. Malware was just written to be a bad dude. And that's all there is. It never had a good purpose. It was just made as malware. So thinking about that, look at the whole picture, devastator instead of the individual robots. So if you don't know what to look for, you won't find it. This is my friend Wilson. The reason why I bring Wilson up here is nobody knew where to find Wilson and Tom Hanks. They were crashed on a desert hour, they're looking in the wrong spot. The thing with software supply chain risk is it's typically tied to malware. But I'm going to let you in on a little secret. It's not as easy as grepping the code base or the application architecture file for malware.dll. It's not that simple. Most attacks, there is a huge repository and known bad malware out there. But most of the attacks, uh, which I'm going to get into, uh, SolarWinds, 3CX, CircleCI, CodeCov, all of these things are novel attacks. They're new. But guess what? They do kind of the same things. They have the same DNA. They have an escalation privilege. They have a port or a socket opening. They have some sort of uh, new capability into a file or an API that you've never seen before. So you have to not just look for the known, which is, again, malware.dll. You have to look for what are the breadcrumb trails. Put on your, your Sherlock Holmes hat and 
do the detective work to say what has changed and why does this not pass the sniff test? And when I mean the sniff test, when your, your husband or your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your, your best friend is like, hey, does this milk smell good? I'm like, dude, why are you giving that to me? If it doesn't smell good, I don't want to smell it. But that's what you're doing with this type of breadcrumb trail. You're, letting, you're doing it so you pass the sniff test. So let's get into the meat of it. This is my buddy Sully. He's actually a nice dude, even though he looks uh, a little bit intimidating here. But these are the monsters in your software supply chain that all these SCA tools can't find. The first one is 3CX. People familiar with 3CX, anybody raising their hand? Yeah. So 3CX, it was interesting because 3CX started to, under, to think they had a problem because a lot of their customers were reaching out to them saying, something is off with this latest release. We're getting these weird alerts and weird reports that something is happening and they're like, huh. Well, they scanned it with one of the um, most prominent virus solutions in, in out there, which is VirusTotal, and it came back clean. Well, it was a very, very unique approach where it was a signed package, but the signing process itself was compromised and the malware was slipped in at the signing process. So it was a signed package, it looked legit, but it was actually compromised. That's something that all those AST tools could not find. This is a tampering of the signature itself. Probably the most famous one is Sunburst, SolarWinds. Again, this attack, and I'm being very you know, simplistic here, was a compromise of the MS build environment. So if you think of that sideways hourglass, that inflection point, it, this malware was inserted right at the last point, the piece that actually built the software itself. So if you scan the open source code, the first party code, did all your testing on this, you would have never found that because it was just basically inserted into the build and was never part of the DevOps pipeline. CodeCov is what I like, if anybody remembers the, the show The Americans, the 1980 spies that were entrenched in the US. This is pretty much the same story. They would always try and put a bug in a phone or a bug on a computer, and again, the computers were uh, not very uh, uh, modern or up to date. A developer for CodeCov was compromised where they were able to access their credentials and insert it directly into the code repository and then just build it as part of the package itself. So again, a different lens of software supply chain risk, something that is not a vulnerability, it is a compromise of the DevOps or the software supply chain to insert malware in new and devious ways. And then the last one was around Circle CI. Circle CI, again, is a predominant CI orchestration system where it was compromised and it affected the secrets. And if you're not familiar with secrets, secrets are the thing that accesses the functionality or the important information. It's the key to the lock to access that. And a lot of times people have programs or uh, policies to update secrets in a, in a consistent rotation pattern, but just like updating you know, the, to the latest version. Not everybody does it. So again, now we're talking about secrets compromise as part of access to data or access to functionality. So software supply chain risks you need to solve. There's always the risk in compliance. You know, the executive order 14028 talking about self-attestation and SBOM, and then there's the NIST standards. You have the software and development release pro uh, process, which is associated with the open source packages, you know, an NPM, PyPy, GitHub, DevOps tooling, the tooling itself, the robots that build the assembly line or the CI orchestration like CircleCI that build it. Uh, you also have the IT software and procurement. Um, am I going to buy this piece of software? And this is the story I always like to kind of talk to people. If you're going to buy some software, you're a consumer of software, not a creator of software, and you probably have certain checks and balances and things you do, here's a security questionnaire. Fill it out. I mean, honestly, please raise your hand if somebody got the security questionnaire back and it says, yeah, our software kind of sucks. It's riddled with holes. Please, uh... You know, we, we promise we'll do better in the future, but just buy it right now because we don't have the money to fix it. Those questionnaires are always going to come back clean. We did all the best things. Do you think SolarWinds or 3CX or any of the other people out there are going to say their software is bad? You need that final exam, that test to prove that the questionnaire is actually truthful. And from a SOC uh, standpoint, once you get all that information, you probably want to do a little deeper dive, sending the information from your software supply chain activities to, to reverse engineer, analyze, and identify that breadcrumb trail, and then really help those SOC analysts move to that next step to help them understand and put them on the right path instead of saying, 
hey, yeah, we got a problem in, our, in, in the latest release. Uh, good luck. Uh, tell me how it's going in an hour. Not practical. I mean, I think Log4j really shows that is when good software packages go bad, you don't know where to actually look because it was never deemed a problem. So talking about effectiveness, one of the biggest things that I find for any application security testing tool is it can't disrupt the process. So being in SAS for so long, one of the two of the biggest issues associated with any SAS solution in a lot of things is when it's a complicated application in terms of size or lines of code, it chokes. It just, it, it can't get through it. And then there's always the depth and breadth of what languages or, hey, I write in, you know, C Sharp versus Java versus Go versus Python versus, the, the list is endless. So thinking about, in order for the solution to work, it has to look, work across many different types of languages and file sizes. Because if they're too big, you don't want to choke the process. And there always has to be intel behind any AST tool. And that includes software supply chain solutions. A lot of times people you know, say, hey, we, we support, I don't know, Go now. Okay, you supported it for two days. Yeah, we, we support it, but we don't look for much. Always look at the uh, kind of the, the, the details about the reputation or the threat intel behind it. For SAS, DAST, IAS, RASP, it's, all these solutions are only as good as the rules that they actually provide or the capability and flexibility. You know, the terms I say rules, it's rules, checkers, queries, all these terms. Those are the things that make all of the AST and software supply chain solutions work, is that intel behind it. So as you're trying to you know, understand software supply chain or application security testing, always look at the intel. One of the pieces, because I had to cut some things out, when you're talking software supply chain, modernization of the creation of SBOM is vitally important. The executive order that I mentioned previously in the follow-on memorandum, which is like, Self-attest, tell us everything in there, but SBOM is now becoming more and more important, and I've talked to a lot of companies and a lot of people. SBOM is not just a list of things in an Excel spreadsheet. It has to be in an industry-recognized format, like Cyclone DX or SPDX or SWID. We have to standardize on that, and if somebody says, oh yeah, we provide you with an SBOM of the open source, well, that's just a part of the application. It's not the entire application. And Again, we don't want to work uh, busy, we want to work smart. If you're creating an SBOM for your first party code, your open source code, your, your, it's just, you can't keep them together. And guess what, if you're released 10 times a day, SBOM has to be part of that software supply chain story. So I know I'm coming up on time here, and you guys, I know it's Saturday, but there is a homework assignment. When you're talking software supply chain security, your homework assignment is go out to all the blue chip application security testing tools that say they do software supply chain security. I guarantee you there is no mention of malware. Malware is really what software supply chain security boils down to. Because most of those attacks, CircleCI and uh, SolarWinds and 3CX and CodeCov and all the other ones that are out there, it's about malware getting into the compiled piece of software that you're either creating or using. And if you're just looking at open source and saying the inheritance of open source is the best way to handle this, yeah, there is issues with open source. People use typo squatting to kind of trick you to download the wrong package, which is the compromised package. But malware itself is the entity you need to be cognizant of within software supply chain. That was my presentation today. Thank you. If anybody has questions, I'll be outside. But thanks for everybody. I know lunch is a good thing to come back from, but you're probably sleepy. So thank you.